So the next speaker, the last speaker of this session is Jeremiah Blocky, uh, Blocky from uh, Perdue. Do I need to share the screen? Okay, yeah. Um. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, so um, excited to talk to you today about uh, the multi-user security of short SNOR signatures uh, with and without pre-processing. This is joint work with uh, Sung Hoon Lee, also at Purdue University. Okay, um, so digital signatures are ubiquitous in cryptography. They have many applications and use cases, uh, message, document authentication, um, authenticating blockchain transactions, uh, used for certificate authorities, electronic signatures, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and there's a lot of properties that uh, we'd like to have for an efficient uh, digital signature scheme. Uh, we'd like them to be short. Uh, we'd like to have efficient uh, signing and verification algorithms. And we'd also like them to achieve k-bit uh, security, which means uh, informally an attacker running in time t wins the signature forgery game with probability at most t over 2 to the k. Finally, we'd like to um, ensure that uh, the digital signature scheme is even secure if the uh, attacker can run a pre-processing attack in which they uh, perform some pre-processing attack in hopes to uh, uh, decrease the online, uh, online attack time. All right, uh, so let's look at uh, some options for uh, sig signature schemes. Uh, we have RSA full domain hash. Uh, the signature length for RSA full domain hash is uh, um, omega k, so it's uh, super linear. Um, elliptic curve DSA and Schnorr signatures get that down to 4k bits. Um, and interestingly, uh, in Schnorr's original paper, uh, there was a proposal for shortening the length of the signature uh, to 3k bits. Uh, the key question, though, is uh, by shortening the signatures, uh, does this adversely impact security? Um, so are short Schnorr sign signatures still secure? Um, do they remain secure even against a pre-processing attacker? Uh, finally, there's also uh, BLS signatures. Uh, these are 2K bit signatures, so even shorter than short snore signatures. Um, the disadvantage, though, is that they require bilinear pairings. Uh, so shorter signatures, but higher computational overhead. And then finally, just uh, for the sake of completeness, uh, we can also go to IO-based uh, signature constructions. We can get uh, K bit signatures. But I stress that this is a purely theoretical construction. Uh, we don't have practical instantiations of I.O., um, so we're not going to consider that uh, for our purposes. OK, uh, so to uh, briefly summarize our results, uh, key question, are short snore signatures still secure? Um, short answer, yes. Uh, short snore signatures still provide k bits of multi-user security, uh, so no concrete security loss for truncating the hash output. Um, our proof is in the uh, random oracle model and generic group model, so uh, we do make uh, every possible idealized assumption, uh, but, uh, um, you know, finding a tight security proof uh, in a non-ideal uh, um, setting, we'll leave that as an open question. Uh, so another key question, are short snore signatures secure against pre-processing attackers? Um, so here we consider the problem and we give two different answers. Uh, so the first answer is no. Uh, short Schnorr signature schemes are not secure against pre-processing attacks. In fact, regular Schnorr signature schemes are not uh, secure against pre-processing attacks. Uh, however, if we uh, modify the Schnorr signature scheme a little bit by uh, key, prefi by key pre prefixing, we obtain a signature scheme that's uh, um, actually secure against pre-processing attacks. Uh, with a slight caveat uh, that we need to increase the size of our group uh, just a little bit to achieve k-bit security. Okay, uh, so let's uh, let's look at the standard Schnorr uh, signature scheme. Uh, so here, our secret key uh, is just a random uh, integer uh, between one and p. Here, p is the size of our group. Uh, our public key is just uh, g, our uh, generator of the cyclic group, raised to the power uh, sk. And to sign, all we're going to do is we're going to pick a random nonce R. We're going to compute G to the R. Uh, and we're going to compute an integer E uh, by hashing I and the message M that we want to sign. 
Uh, then finally, we're going to compute s uh, by taking r and adding uh, our secret key multiplied by this value e. Um, and our signature will just be s and e. Now notice that s and e are both uh, um, 2k bit uh, integers, so our total signature length here is, is 4k bits. Uh, verification works in the opposite direction, uh, given uh, our message m, uh, s and e. We can compute g to the s times pk to the minus e. Um, if the signature was generated honestly, then uh, what we're going to get back is just g to the r. And uh, in this case, uh, we expect that hash of r concatenated with m is going to give us back e. Um, so that'll just be uh, um, the check that we perform during verification. OK, uh, so public parameters here. We've got a group uh, and a hash function, which maps uh, messages to, uh, um, item it, to elements in, in ZP. Uh, so the short Schnorr signature scheme is uh, essentially the same thing uh, with a very small modification. Here we're just going to change the hash function so that it outputs a random integer um, between 1 and 2 to the k. Um, so we've shrunk it from 2k bits uh, to k bits. Uh, that's the only change. Uh, and uh, making this change, we obtain the short Schnorr signature scheme. OK, uh, so we're going to analyze the short Schnorr signature scheme in the, gener in the generic group model. Uh, the generic group model was introduced by uh, Shoup in 97 to model generic attacks on uh, discrete log type problems. Um, here, uh, we're modeling any attack which doesn't exploit specific structure of our cyclic group. So with lots of generality, we're just going to assume our group is uh, ZP. Um, and we're going to assume that uh, the attacker accesses this group uh, um, through specific oracles. Um, so we're going to assume that we have a function tau. This is a random injective function, which maps group elements to binary strings or their handles. Um, and then we have a multiplication oracle, which takes as input the handles for two group elements, uh, x and y, and outputs the handle for the new group element, x plus y. Um, so yeah, input handle for uh, group elements, x and y, output handle for, the, for x plus y. Uh, we'll also consider a couple other oracles. Uh, inverse uh, computes the inverse of an item x, uh, or power uh, computes uh, um, x to the power, power n. So input here is the handle for a group element uh, x and an integer n. Output is the handle for the group element n times x mod, uh, mod p. OK, uh, so uh, sample uh, result in the generic group model. Uh, we can show that any attacker making t uh, queries to the generic group uh, oracles solves the discrete log problem with probability at most uh, t squared over 2 to the 2k. Just a simple bound to prove in the generic group model. Now, in our setting, we're also interested in uh, looking at pre-processing attackers. Uh, so here, uh, the attacker can be divided into two parts. Uh, there's the offline attacker, uh, who takes as input uh, the secret uh, random encoding function tau, which maps uh, group elements to their binary strings or handles, uh, and outputs an s-bit hint, uh, sigma. Um, so in this case, uh, there's no bound on the running time of the offline attacker. He can uh, run as long as he wants. The only constraint is the, the size of the hint that the offline attacker outputs. Then we have an online attacker that uh, can use this hint uh, during its attack. Of course, the online attacker has a bounded running time, so it's bounded in the total amount of computation it can perform, total number of Oracle queries it can make, et cetera. Um, so motivation for looking at uh, pre-processing attackers here, uh, well, uh, in real-world crypto systems, there's a handful of groups that uh, tend to be, be used. Uh, so an attacker would be highly motivated to perform a offline uh, phase attack where they do some pre-processing on one of these groups in the hope of speeding up their online attack. Um, so uh, here's an example result in the uh, um, generic group uh, with pre-processing setting. Uh, so uh, Corrigan Gibbs and uh, Dimitri Kogan uh, proved that uh, any pre-processing attacker uh, making, uh, I guess, uh, uh, running in time t uh, using an s bint hint uh, solves the discrete log problem with probability at most s times t squared over 2 to the 2k. Um, right, so that's, uh, that's a bound that's, uh, but that's known for the pre-processing setting. Okay, um, and in our setting, uh, we're interested in looking at the generic group model and random oracle model with pre-processing. Uh, so here, the offline attacker is given the encoding of the uh, generic group. Uh, they're also given 
uh, Oracle access to our random Oracle H, and uh, they can run for a while and output an SBIT hint. Uh, now I should stress here that uh, for technical reasons, we're going to assume that uh, the offline attacker is bounded in the number of queries that it can make to the random Oracle, uh, but the bound will typically be a very large bound. So for example, the offline attacker can make, make let's say uh, two to the three K uh, queries to the, uh, to the random Oracle before outputting the, the hint. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the online attacker can use this hint, uh, but uh, has bounded running time in terms of number of queries to the uh, uh, generic group oral, generic group oracles or random oracle. Okay, uh, so now we're interested in analyzing the multi-user uh, security of uh, um, Schnorr signatures. Uh, so, in the multi-user security game, the challenger generates our public keys. Uh, sends them to the attacker. The attacker can submit queries to the challenger, and basically each query is a request to sign a message M with the key of the ith user, and the challenger will respond with the corresponding signature. Uh, we can continue querying the, the signing oracle, and eventually the attacker has to output a forgery for one of the user's uh, signatures for some message M prime of the attacker's choosing. Uh, the attacker wins if uh, the signature is valid, if it verifies, and if uh, the uh, value I prime M prime is fresh. So in other words, we haven't submitted this query to, uh, uh, to the challenger uh, to get a signature in the past. Um, okay, now in the pre-processing setting, the game is exactly the same, except now the uh, online attacker is additionally given this SBIT hint, which was generated by the, by the pre-processing attacker. Okay, uh, so our results. Uh, informally, we prove that uh, any attacker making at most Q Oracle queries uh, in the random Oracle and generic group model wins the multi-user uh, signature forgery game against the short Schnorr signature scheme with probability at most uh, Q plus N over two to the K. Um, so I wanna uh, pause here to stress that this is uh, stronger than the naive uh, bound, which would be Q times N over two to the K. Um, so just as an example, if uh, K was 112, uh, N was two to the 32, Q is two to the 80, uh, the naive bound would actually give us nothing. It would just tell us that the attacker's probability of forging a signature is one. Uh, whereas our bound would give us, uh, you know, the attacker's probability is at most uh, two to the minus 32. Um, so I should note here that uh, um, Kiltz et al. Uh, proved a similar bound for regular Schnorr signatures. Um, and uh, the authors later uh, um, let us know through personal communication that uh, their analysis actually extends to the short Schnorr signature scheme, even though that's not uh, mentioned in their, in their paper explicitly. Um, so, however, the generic group model used uh, in their analysis is not equivalent to Shoup's uh, generic group model. And in particular, it's not suitable for analyzing pre-processing attacks. Um, okay. Uh, so. Uh, for pre-processing attacks, uh, we prove the following bound. Uh, let's suppose that our pre-processing attacker makes at most uh, um, Q pre random Oracle queries during its pre-processing phase and then outputs an SBIT hint, uh, which can be used by the online attacker. Uh, if the online attacker makes at most Q on Oracle queries uh, during the online phase, then uh, this attacker can win the uh, uh, multi-user signature forgery game against key prefixed short Schnorr signatures with probability at most, uh, and then we've got this, uh, this complicated looking expression here. Um, so first comment here uh, is what is key prefixing? Key prefixing, we're just going to modify the Schnorr signature scheme uh, by injecting the public key whenever we uh, query the random oracle. Um, so instead of computing E as uh, tau of R concatenated with M, we're just gonna prepend the public key for the user. So that's the only change we're making. Now, you might wonder why is key prefixing ne necessary? Well, actually, there's a trivial preprocessing attack uh, if the attacker can generate e equals zero signatures. So, in other words, uh, um, let's suppose the preprocessing attacker outputs a hint um, r, comma, m, such that uh, hash of tau of r uh, concatenated with m is zero. Okay, so if we're not doing key, uh, key prefixing, uh, now notice that r, comma, zero is actually guaranteed to be a valid Schnorr signature for any message uh, um, uh, for M under any public key that we might generate. Uh, 
right? So this is kind of a master signature that works under any public key. Um, so trivially, uh, Schnorr signatures are broken under pre-processing attacks. Uh, but uh, um, if we, um, yeah, if we make this modification and use key prefixing, then, uh, then we do get security. Now, um, I should note that several standardized implementations of Schnorr signatures explicitly disallow equal zero signatures, uh, so that rules out the attack that I just uh, described in the, in the slide. Um, so actually, this is an open research challenge, is to quantify the security or insecurity of Schnorr signatures against pre-processing attacks when uh, equal zero signatures are explicitly disallowed, but when we're not using key prefixing. Um, so that could be an open, an interesting question to, to look into. Okay, uh, so let me just comment a little bit about the concrete uh, security bound here. Um, so uh, here we want to achieve k-bit security. Uh, we're going to assume that uh, the pre-processing attacker can make, uh, let's say, two to the three k queries to our random oracle. Uh, that's a lot of uh, a lot of queries in the pre-processing phase. So, for example, uh, if k is 128, that's uh, two to the 384 queries that we're allowing to the attacker to make. Um, but the attacker is limited in that they can only output an S-bit hint at the end of the day. Now, uh, to achieve k-bit security here, uh, the middle term becomes a little bit uh, problematic. Uh, so to achieve k-bit security, we actually have to increase our group size a little bit. Uh, so instead of p is 2 to the 2k, we need to set it to be uh, 2 to the 2k times sn times log p. Uh, but we can still keep our shorter uh, k-bit hash outputs. Okay, uh, and in this case, our signature length is uh, k plus log base 2 of p, which works out to be 3k plus log of s plus log of n. Here, uh, n is the number of users that we're considering in the multi-user security game. s is the size of the hint that the attacker outputs. Uh, so, for example, if, uh, if the attacker can output a 2 to the k over 2 bit hint and n is 2 to the k over 4, uh, then our signature length is roughly 3.75 k-bits, which is still shorter than the original Schnorr signature scheme. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm not going to go through the whole proof, uh, but uh, I wanted to just give you a few uh, key technical ideas for details, see the, see the paper. Um, so uh, we're using compression arguments uh, all over the place in the, in the paper. Um, the basic idea is if, that if the pre-processing attacker wins the multi-user signature forgery game with larger than expected probability, we can either compress the generic group mapping tau or the random oracle h. Um, now, of course, uh, information theory tells us that a random oracle h and this injective mapping tau should both be in incompressible, so that, uh, that would yield a contradiction. Um, so, we really kind of split our analysis into two cases. Uh, case one, uh, we can use the attacker to find a non-trivial linear relationship. Uh, so we've got uh, um, secret keys x1 to xk. If the attacker can find uh, some vector a and uh, some integer b such that a dot x is equal to b, uh, the attacker has found a non-trivial linear relationship. This can be used to compress the uh, uh, generic group mapping tau. Um, so that will be one case uh, where we'll compress the group mapping tau. Uh, the other case is that the attacker somehow manages to successfully forge signatures without, un without uncovering non-trivial linear relationships. And in this case, we argue that we can use the signature forgery attacker to compress the random oracle H. Okay, um, so the security reduction, uh, we're going to use the uh, signature attacker to win a game which we call the multi-user bridge game. Um, so here we've got inputs uh, uh, tau x1 through tau xn. These correspond to the public signing keys in, uh, in our signature scheme. And what we're going to do is we're going to simulate our signature attacker. Um, and uh, whenever the signature attacker queries our signing oracle, we're actually going to program the random oracle to allow us to forge, uh, forge signatures. Okay? Um, and what we managed to prove on the one hand is that the probability the attacker wins the bridge game is greater than or equal to the probability our signature attacker wins the signature forgery game minus, uh, um, minus these uh, big O terms uh, shown here. And uh, the analysis of the, of the middle terms involves a compression argument on the random oracle. I'm not gonna, not gonna go into it. If you're interested, see, see details in the paper. Um, 
But uh, you know, on the other hand, uh, what we can prove is that the probability the attacker wins the bridge game is at most uh, uh, this, uh, Sn q squared log p over p. So here, s is the size of the hint, n is the number of users, uh, q is the number of queries the attacker makes in the online phase. Um, and the proof idea here is just a compression argument with, uh, with the generic group model. OK, um, so let's, uh, let's introduce this, uh, this bridge game. And uh, to introduce the bridge game, we're going to try to maintain uh, a, an invariant while we simulate our signature forgery attacker. The invariant we're going to maintain is that uh, every output of a uh, generic, group or, uh, generic group query can be explained. Um, right, so we want to maintain a list of tuples of the form uh, tau y um, a, uh, oh, I guess this, this should be b here. Uh, so we want uh, to basically be able to explain y is equal to uh, b plus uh, a dot x, where x is the uh, x1 to xn, are, these are the unknown uh, secret keys. So initially, our list is just going to contain uh, um, entries for uh, the generator, which is tau1. Uh, here, b is 1, uh, a is 0. And then uh, we'll have entries for tau of x1 through tau of xn. Here, b is 0, and uh, um, our vector here is u1, u2, u3, uh, just the unit vectors uh, with a 1 in the ith, uh, ith coordinate. OK, and we want to maintain this invariant. Uh, so let's suppose the attacker queries the multiplication oracle uh, with uh, tau of x1 and tau of x2. Uh, well, that's going to generate a new element, uh, tau of x1 plus x2. Uh, so we can uh, update uh, our table with the explanation here. So uh, um, this element is just uh, our vector a would just be u of 1 plus u of 2, and uh, b would just be 0. Um, if we multiplied x1 by, uh, by tau of 1, uh, we're going to get uh, uh, the same vector a. So a would be u of 1 and b would be 1. And similarly, uh, right, for other generic group oracles, we can, uh, we can update this list. Uh, now we might run into a, a problem here. Uh, and this problem that we encounter is what happens if the attacker queries the, um, queries the generic group oracle with an element uh, eta, where eta is just some random binary string that we haven't seen before. Um, so this could, uh, this could throw us off and prevent us from maintaining our invariant. Uh, so the question is, if the attacker makes such a query, how do we update our list L? Um, we can't simply find uh, B in uh, A vector uh, to, to update the list. Uh, to address this challenge, we're going to introduce uh, what we call the restricted discrete log oracle. Um, so we're actually going to give the attacker access to a, an oracle which solves the discrete log problem. Now, of course, if we just uh, gave the attacker uh, access to this oracle without any restrictions, this would make breaking security trivial. So we're going to um, restrict uh, the attacker's access to this oracle. And in particular, we're only going to allow the attacker to make uh, uh, queries to the restricted discrete log oracle if the input is fresh. So in other words, if the input doesn't already occur in our list L, then the attacker can query, uh, uh, can query this restricted discrete log oracle. So for example, the attacker can't query the oracle to find one of the secret keys. They can't do tricks like uh, create linear combinations of the secret keys and then query the discrete log oracle. But if they pick a fresh uh, binary string, they can query the discrete log oracle to get the discrete log of this new, uh, new group element. OK, uh, so now that we have this restricted discrete log oracle, uh, we can use it to, uh, to maintain our invariant and update, uh, update our list L. Uh, now, uh, as we're updating this list L, uh, we'll say that the bridge event occurs if we find a non-trivial non linear dependence. So in other words, if we end up adding the same group element to our, our list twice with different explanations. So suppose we add a group element eta to our list twice, uh, once with a vector uh, a1, b1, and the second time with a vector a2, b2, where uh, the explanations are, are distinct. In this case, we uh, find a non-trivial -li non linear dependence, which we can use to compress the generic uh, group oracle. So just as a simple example, suppose that a queries the multiplication oracle on tau of x1 and tau of x2, which gives us uh, um, you know, particular binary string. Then suppose they query the uh, generic group oracle with tau of 1 and tau of x5. And let's suppose that uh, we got a collision. Uh, 
In this case, what we learn is that uh, x1 plus x2 is equal to 1 plus x5. Uh, that gives us a non-trivial linear dependence, uh, which allows us to compress the, the generic group oracle. Okay. Um, good, so we'll call this a bridge event, and what we proved is that uh, the probability the attacker can cause the bridge event to occur um, is upper bounded as follows. Okay, um, so uh, sweeping a lot of technical details under the, under the rug here, but uh, if you're interested, see the paper. Um, so in conclusion, what we proved, uh, we proved that the short Schnorr signature scheme uh, um, gives us three k-bit signatures with uh, k-bits of security. Um, and essentially all we do is just truncate the hash output. Uh, so we prove that uh, truncation of the hash output does not adversely impact any of the concrete security guarantees, uh, um, even with multi-user security. Uh, we also looked at uh, key prefixed Schnorr signature schemes versus pre-processing attackers. Um, we showed that key prefixing is necessary, and uh, um, we showed that we can continue to truncate the hash outputs with, uh, without uh, concrete security loss. However, we do need to increase the size of our group uh, by a multiplicative factor roughly n times s to, uh, to achieve k-bit security. Um, and then there's an open question, uh, which is to understand the security or insecurity of key, uh, non-key prefixed nor signatures when we explicitly disallow equal zero signatures. Um, I should also mention that uh, our compression arguments uh, also hold for other uh, signature schemes like Chom Peterson or Cat Swing signatures uh, for details, uh, see the paper. All right, uh, so thanks for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jeremiah. Uh, questions? I think Stefan has a yeah, question. Quick one. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. So, mm -hmm. can you say, uh, maybe you said something, but I missed it. Can you say something about the tightness of the n times s? Oh, the tightness of the n times so s. So, the s is clear that it's tight, right? But the n times s? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Okay, I'd have to. I want to do some offline pre processing before I uh, <laughs> offer a definitive response. Yeah. Um, the s is definitely required. I think For there the might argument. be some possibility of removing the n uh, n term, but I'd have to I'd have to think more about it. Uh, okay, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So the pre-processing mm -hmm. boundary, you get, do you have matching attacks uh, in particular for the uh, term that has the pre-processing random process value? Uh, for the term that uh, has... Jeremiah, uh, could you repeat the question? Okay, so the question is uh, for the term uh, with random oracle queries, uh, um, is our pre-processing bound tight? Uh, so, uh, well, because we, because the random oracle is only outputting k-bit hashes, uh, we can't get anything better than k-bit security. Uh, like, there's just no hope to get anything better. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, we can't uh, we can't tighten the bounds. Uh, one place where one might be able to tighten the balances in terms of the number of queries that the offline attacker is allowed to make. Uh, so we do restrict the offline attacker to make uh, uh, two to the three K queries, um, and uh, which you know is a very large number of queries. But uh, you know maybe one could remove this uh, restriction. Uh, um, we needed to make that restriction for some technical reasons, but uh, I don't know. It might be possible to get get rid of it. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> Uh, if not, then let's thank the speaker again, and we have now a lunch, and we meet at 20 past uh, 2 for the next session.